And now it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Elfrida Hebert. Dr. Hebert is the founder and CEO of Text Project. Text Project is a nonprofit organization that provides educators with resources, strategies, news, and information that will help them help their students. Oh, sorry, I think we've got a problem with the audio. Just a moment. Uh, so really the organization is dedicated to helping teachers help their students uh, achieve high levels of literacy. Dr. Hebert has truly devoted her career to literacy. She has immersed herself in the field of reading acquisition for the past 40 years. Dr. Hebert was a classroom teacher and a college professor. She has carried out extensive research on various topics and has been published widely in academic journals, books, and articles. I'm quite certain that as you listen to Dr. Hebert today, you will appreciate the passion she brings to her work, as well as her ability to present relevant research in a way that feels very accessible and practical. And now I would like to turn the controls over to Dr. Hebert, and you will experience just a few moments of transition on your screen as I do this, so bear with me. Thanks so much, Jenny, and thank you all for joining us today. My topic today relates to a particular kind of vocabulary, a vocabulary that I'm going to call the Corco vocabulary, and this is an absolutely central part of increasing one's capacity with complex text. I'm going to cover I'm using a different computer than I usually use for presentations, so um, bear with me here. So I'm going to um, ask three questions today and hopefully provide uh, succinct but comprehensive answers as to why and the what and the how of core vocabulary. So in looking at why is core vocabulary important, and I'm also going to do some definition here of core vocabulary. It just didn't um, deal very well with it. It didn't integrate very well with my organization of why, what, and how. Um, because I wanted to talk about the what in terms of specific features of core vocabulary. But English vocabulary in texts are distributed very uniquely a very small number of words accounts for most of the words in texts. So as this slide shows, 2,500 complex word families, and I've given you some examples there, 2,500 words account for 90% of the words in most texts. Now, there's another, and keep remembering, it's 2,500 complex word families. So it's not just individual words, but it's families of words. So right away we start thinking that implies certain things about teaching students about vocabulary. There's another 10% of the vocabulary that comes from an enormous group of words about 88,000 complex word families. Now clearly, we can't cover everything. And I've spent many, many papers and webinars talking about ways in which we can give students a sense, an understanding, a generative approach to, those, to that vocabulary. But today I wanna focus on this core vocabulary. Because if you're really slow and not automatic with the core vocabulary, you're never going to be a proficient reader of complex text. What I've done is I've taken all of the exemplars of the common core, you know, in Appendix B, and keep remembering those are examples, not a canon to be taught. But if those are the examples, that have been identified as being complex text, I ask the question, what percentage of the texts are accounted for by this core vocabulary? And as you can see here, 
There are some cases, for example, in grades six to eight, there are some unusual texts uh, about technology, so the percentage goes down a little bit. But what you see here is even with college and career ready text, we have a large percentage of all the words and text, the total words and text come from this small group of words. Now, when we look at individual texts, like this one, these are from the um, fourth, fifth exemplar list. We can see that in a group of 50 words, some texts have very, very few words that fall into that purple group. And what I want you to be doing while you're looking at this is get a sense of what that 2,500 complex word families are like. There are lots of words in that group. 2,500 might not seem a lot in relation to 88,000, but for kids who are learning to read, that is a lot. So here you see in the little prints, this means that there are about, if there are three per 50, that means there are about six per 100. And in some texts, like the secret garden, there are more than 10 words per 100. In this case, we're seeing that they're using some strange dialect. There are also a lot of unusual compound words like footman. Um, but the point is that 90% of the vocabulary typically comes from this core group. And there's another 10% that if you want to learn more, I've presented some webinars, I've written articles about those. And if you can't jot this down quickly enough, this presentation is already posted, the, the PowerPoint is, at Text Project. Okay, so that's not going to be my focus today, that extra other, the rare vocabulary. I'm going to talk about this core vocabulary because we're increasingly finding out that for a lot of American students, starting in about the third grade, they're able to recognize lots of words but they do it very slowly. And I'm suggesting one of the reasons is, is that they don't have automaticity in recognizing the meanings of the core vocabulary. So when they see a word, they don't instantly recognize some of the meanings. So let's take a look at a couple of texts that have been leveled according to the approach that I'm talking about. And just look here to see what some of the words in yellow are. So we've got words like accident and camera. Um, hiking and hikers isn't. But we've got body, um, famous. Those are examples of words that are in that core vocabulary. So it's not just the Dolch words. It goes much beyond that. So here's a little bit higher level. We see words like especially, favorite, village. Okay, so this core vocabulary isn't just a uh, and the and it and is, but also words like terrible and versions and sale and person, Europe, so that they're colony. So there are lots of words in this group. What are the features of the 2,500 complex word families? Well, some of them are actually concrete words. And I'm going to talk in the final section of the presentation on how we teach to really develop automaticity and facility with the meanings of this core vocabulary. These words can be taught with illustrations, with pictures, with discussions. They don't need some of the extensive instruction that other words in the core vocabulary need. Okay, so this is an important distinction. One of the distinctions I'm going to make here is that all the words in the core vocabulary aren't the same. And don't think of them as simply the Dolch words. Yes, the Dolch words are part of it, but keep remembering this is 2,500 word families. So if we've got about 200 Dolch words, that's only a small percentage. Okay, so some of the words, so that's a pretty healthy chunk there, about 500 of them can actually be taught through illustrations, through pictures. And I'm gonna show you some places where you can find some of those to help you with this instruction. This is especially critical 
with English language learners and kids who haven't been around lots of school literacy kinds of experiences before they come to school. A second feature of the core vocabulary is another group almost as big as the concrete group come from a, a set of words that we sometimes call general academic words. So there's a new one of these lists. We for very long used the academic word list that came from New Zealand and was based on high school, excuse me, college texts. A new list that's available on the internet, Davies and Gardner actually comes from American school books and is relevant to American high up elementary, middle school, and high school students. And there's some examples of those words. These words are very, very abstract. In a sense, they're, they're um, an upper level Dolch like list. Okay, I'm not at all encouraging it to teach them like we've often taught the Dolch words, which in my view, we need to kind of move away from, which was asking kids to memorize the words. What I'm suggesting is that these are very abstract words and they can take on lots of different meanings and they can even take on lots of different, oh, right, several different parts of speech. A third feature of these words, because keep remembering I'm saying that they're complex word families, this group of 2,500 words encompasses about 12,000 words. So that means for every word, there are about five or six members. In some cases, there are more than that because words like the don't have morphological relatives, but most of the words in the 2500 do. So what we see is that there are lots of prefixes and suffixes and inflected endings, and this is especially true with this general academic vocabulary. The vocabulary that you see in informational text of lots of different content areas, and they often also pop up in stories or in um, how-to texts. Okay, for example, if you were looking at something about um, building something, you might have that you need to apply a varnish. Okay, so these are highly prolific words. As you can see, um, they vary in how many members they have in their families, but most of these words, especially in the general academic vocabulary, are highly prolific. Now, when we talk about morphological families, one of the things that I want to really, and this is really critical for primary teachers, for upper L teachers, but especially primary, a major way in which we make new words on the Anglo-Saxon, so English has a couple different historical roots, mostly from Anglo-Saxon as a base, and then from French with some Greek words at the top of the pyramid for very technical uh, terms. But a lot of our common words come from that base of the pyramid, the word pyramid, where we've got German words, in the, which is Anglo-Saxon, and the way in which those words are put together to create and explain new concepts is compounding. And in English, we do a lot of compounding. When we invent something new like the internet, we do a lot of compounding like software, ebook, okay, and here are some examples of compounding with these very basic words, okay, so a lot of the compounding occurs among the most common of the 25 word families, and as I'm going to show you in just a minute, you know, there's varying degrees of frequency among these 2,500 words, but among the ones that are very, very common, we see lots of compounding, a really critical strategy to teach, especially in the primary grades. And one of the things about these words is that all of the words with the um, head or end word in the compound word don't necessarily mean the same thing. Okay? Compound words can often be used very idiosyncratically. So, you know, an eyeball is not something that one throws. Kids might have the notion that, you know, baseball and handball, something you throw. Ballroom 
is something that's different as well, right? Okay, a fourth feature of compound words, excuse me, of core vocabulary, which makes core vocabulary so critical to have lots of experiences with, is that many of these words have multiple meanings. I've given you the most common meanings from an elementary dictionary for these three words, and I've put in bold the words that actually, the uses that are in content areas. So for example, the word function, you know, you might hear of somebody attending a social function, but it has a very different meaning when we use it in mathematics. So what I've described now is that there's this basic group of words that is ubiquitous to text. If you've got a text with sentences, you've got the core vocabulary. And this core vocabulary, it's highly frequent because it's so versatile. But I've suggested that there are some differences within the core vocabulary. Now, what I'm not suggesting here is that the core vocabulary be treated like the Dolch words. Okay? That's not appropriate. When I go on the internet, I find lots of word lists like this. Another very popular thing um, with new technologies is that you can make flashcards. Because these words are so multifaceted, right? They take on prefixes and suffixes. They have inflected endings, and that can make them be spelled and used a little differently. They have multiple meanings. Many of them, the, the um, more common words can be used in compound words where they have very idiosyncratic meanings. This isn't about word lists and flashcards. Now, I've put um, a copy of the words, actually they're in the form of the 4,000 simple word families on my website, and I'm just begging you not to make me the next generation Edward Dolch. In other words, don't be sending these lists home with kids and saying it's the Hebert list. And then kids are going to come and try and find me to find out why am I ever put these fairly meaningless, I mean, on a list. It isn't vibrant. These words aren't morphing into all these different roles and meanings that they have. So the intent of putting that list on the website is for you as educators to get adept at recognizing the diversity in these words, but also how present they are in the text that you're using with the students and recognizing when there are a lot of words, you know, the other 10% that might be unique to that text and to your students. So how can we teach these words? Well, I've already described that there are some big differences in these words. And differences in words mean differences in instruction. So one way in which you teach a group, and remember I said it was about 20%, so that's about 575 of the words on this list. I hope I did my math right, it's close. I actually, it's about 500, right? So about 500 of the words are concrete and they can be taught, they can be learned very much more quickly through the use of images. Now, I don't have all 500 of these words in a group right now on my website. We're working on that. But I have about 700 pictures of words, including some of these, in content area clusters. At Text Project, they're called word pictures. But I'm suggesting that talk, talking about a valley, and this word is used fairly consistently, or talking about a canyon, or talking about a cave, without showing these pictures, is really going to take a lot more time, especially for kids who depend on schools to become literate. Those are kids who are English language learners, kids who come from backgrounds where they haven't had a lot of experience with academic concepts. Okay, so we know 
unequivocally that words that are concrete are learned more quickly. There are psychologists who have worked hard to explain the mechanisms, and these are all theories because we can't take the brain apart, although we're getting a better picture of the brain. But we do know that adults, children, everyone retains in memory a concrete word more readily than a highly abstract one. Okay, so that also brings us to the use of word maps for content area words. So all of the words on this map here are actually picturable. But what we want to start doing is bringing some of those ideas together. And that's actually what we have done at Text Project is to provide you with word clusters, pictures for word clusters around critical topics and content areas. So if you go onto the website where pictures content words, you're going to see some of these clusters of pictures. Okay? But even if you don't have the pictures, what I'm suggesting here, and I'm going to show you this text in a little bit, what we want to do is to show students how the ideas fit together. Keep in memory, reading is all about knowledge. We're not just trying technically to get kids to read so we can kind of give a big sigh of relief they're reading. They're, we're needing them to read because knowledge is actually in text. Yes, we've got DVDs, we've got TV, but most of the knowledge that came into the DVD TV show actually started as a written script. So if you want to participate in the informational digital age, knowing how to read and acquire knowledge from text is essential. So this is a really critical idea here that we've taken words that are connected and some of them won't be as concrete as the ones that I'm showing, like the word species, for example, that's not a concrete word. But some of these other ideas need to be organized around ideas like species instead of nests. I could have used habitat, okay, which is also not going to be a word that kids immediately know in the same way that they might know sticks and mud. But what I'm suggesting here is that we need to do clustering of words around content maps. Another concept is that we need to do a lot with teaching kids about this underlying structure of the morphological family. We spend a lot of time on phonics instruction, but when it comes to morphological families, and I am not talking here about teaching the prefixes and the suffixes as distinct entities, I'm talking about how would you use the word apply, words from the apply family differently in these contexts? Now I'm going to show you some examples where um, the folks at Reading Plus have actually done something like this. So you're going to ask, where can I get that? Um, this is something that we're working on a lot at Text Project to make some things like this available. So what we've done here is we've um, We've got a huge database of, of digitized books, and we pull sentences with the root word and members of the morphological family. So I'm going to show you how the folks at Reading Plus have been doing some of this. Okay, but I want you to understand the concept. We want kids to be using these words, and preferably in real texts, uh, we want them to extend this to writing. But it's not just memorizing prefixes and suffixes. It's seeing what different forms of the word do. Okay, So for example, she stood in line for an application, not for an apply. Um, she can take home an application, Okay, someone applying for a job. So these are important notions of applying that kind of, I didn't mean that to be a pun, but we're applying knowledge of the word apply. Okay, and the most critical aspect, how do you get really good at these 2,500 complex word families? You read 
an enormous amount. But I'm going to suggest that you don't just read anything when you're at the beginning stages and when you're a struggling reader. That you have to ask, as a reader, you have to ask for texts that actually scaffold this vocabulary for you. Okay? So one of the things that we've been doing a lot in the last 25 years in the United States, and unlike what the Common Core writer said, the text in the elementary grades have not decelerated in difficulty over the last 50 years. In fact, they've increased in difficulty. There's some new research studies. You can contact me if you want um, the citations for those. But the point is that we have not scaffolded the text very well. In many of the beginning texts, our students see a lot of the words from the 10% and a dis disproportionate percentage of words from the 10% are in a lot of the level books, the guided reading books. And those words often change, typically they change from text to text. So in one text you were reading about iguanas, the next one about circus animals. Okay, and the word iguana doesn't keep getting repeated over and over again, so you don't get facility with it, nor do you get facility with the words that are surrounding iguana or circus animals, that is, the core vocabulary. So what I'm suggesting here is that to develop proficiency with the core vocabulary, what you want, what you need as a reader, and for teachers you need support for this, through scaffolded text. So I told you, right, that 90% of the words, so 90% of the words come from these categories that I describe as zones red, green, and yellow. So the yellow zone are words that appear 100 times or more per million words, and the words in this red and green zone appear 10 to 99 times. And then the other 10%, those words appear nine or fewer times in the vast majority of the words. Keep remembering, this isn't how many words there are. This represents um, how many words they account for in the text. Actually, the yellow group is about a thousand words, and the dolch words are just about here. Okay? Um, so what we want is some steady support up this scaffold when you're, when you're a struggling reader or when you're uh, a beginning reader. You don't want texts that have a lot of these words up at the top of the yellow zone, or a lot of red and blue words, because those words are going to be hard words for you if you're reading down here. Okay. So what I'm suggesting, we've heard about the staircase of text complexity. I'm saying there's actually a staircase when we're evaluating texts of core vocabulary. And we actually want kids to get pretty good with text where about 95, 96% of the words come from the yellow zone. And then we move up to the next zone and the next zone. And then we can read texts that have been completely not addressing how the, you know, that there is some scaffolding there. They've been written by people who don't even think about some of these things. Now, I'm not saying these are Dick and Jane kinds of texts. I want to show you that we can write very, very intriguing texts. And because of digital analyses, you know, I don't study texts and just tick them off word by word. I actually have um, a computer program, right, where we analyze how many of the words fit into the yellow zone, the green zone, or the red zone, and then the uh, blue and purple zones. What we want are to create compelling texts or to find compelling texts. For example, Dr. Zeus knew how to write in, this, in, the, in the yellow zone. Arna Lobel, who wrote the Owl books, Frog and Toad, he knew how to write in the yellow zone with a sprinkling of words from the green zone. He didn't, well, actually, Dr. Zeus consciously uh, set out to do that, and Lobel did too. Um, but we've kind of moved away from that. I'm not saying these are algorithmically 
determine. So during the Dick and Jane period, we actually had an algorithm. The words had to be repeated so and so many times. They needed to not have so and so many spaces between things. What, what I'm suggesting here, and I think I must have lost a page here. Just let me see if I can. Oh, that's too bad. Because um, I thought I had, yep, I, I didn't bring in the, um, the bird passage with the bird's nest that I had actually created the web for. I was probably so anxious to create the web that I actually eliminated the passage. So I apologize for you to you. It's available at Text Project. But the point that I wanted to make is that the first passage I was going to show you has a volume three up there, which means that 3% of the words actually sit above here. So these are passages for struggling readers that are available for free at Text Project. The Bird's Nest passage actually is volume one. So that means that 1% of the words sit up here at the top of the staircase. Okay, the rest of the words all come from these groups of words, with the majority of them coming from the yellow and green groups at this point in time. I'm not working with beginning readers. That's the beginning reads at Text Project. That's a different story. Okay, but with struggling readers, we're wanting to give them lots and lots of experience. Most of them can decode these words. They just aren't facile with the meanings of these words. And keep remembering, words like ball actually can take on lots of different kinds of functions. And this is a passage that is explicit about that. So in the FYIs, for kids, we actually go up to volume five, which means on our staircase, 5% of the words sit up here and 95% are in these groups with the majority of the words in the green and the yellow groups. Okay, let me show you some additional ones. And these are actually oh, um, talking points for kids, which is also a text project for free download is another example. And I just want to put in a plug for these kinds of texts because in talking points, there are six, five or six separate articles that are connected to a particular topic, and all of these texts have been written with two to three percent hard words. The rest of the words are from the yellow, green, and red zones. But what's interesting here is this really resembles the performance tasks that are being integrated into the new generation assessments, such as Smarter Balanced in Park. And there actually are some activities that are performance-based assessment at the end of these topics. We've only got 10 of them, but they are both accessible in terms of the core vocabulary. They're giving kids experience with the core vocabulary. But they're also, do you notice here that these aren't Dick and Jane texts with um, innocuous information? These are texts with critical and important information. So we're complying with the most basic function of reading instruction, and that is that kids are reading so that they can acquire knowledge, so that they can learn things, but at the same time, they're developing proficiency with um, the core vocabulary. Now, I want to go back to, and these are actually some of the Reading Plus um, passages. Remember, I'm an advisor for Reading Plus. I'm not a royalty holder, so um, any, any funds that I got, I've already gotten. So um, I just want to show you how they took this model and applied it to the creation of text so that kids who are struggling as readers, kids who need to get off to a good start because we know that they're potentially at risk, have a really solid foundation in the most core of the core vocabulary. So we're actually going to move up the staircase. So here you see that the words hiking and shortcut, good example of a compound word, right? And that's a word that kids should be able to figure out. Hiking, we've got lots of forms of that word, so you're going to get good at that morphological family, hikers. Um, and I think somewhere the word hike might be there, but that might be in the latter part of the text. I'm only showing you a portion, remember, of the text. And as you see here, 
we go to a slightly larger or a greater percentage of words that fall outside the, the, the um, scaffold where we would want kids to be at this point. Okay, so I'm moving them up the staircase. And then finally, in level E, you're seeing that we've increased the numbers of words in the red zone because we're expecting that kids have enough facility with some of the other words so that they can actually have an opportunity to, practice, to, to, to really focus on some of the words that are unique to the red zone and then moving on to the words that are more rare. Here's another example where, um, and, and this is part of the Reading Plus program, which I just think is so important, where some of these general academic words are repeated consistently and the kids' attention is actually called to these uses, the morphological uses. So you're actually seeing, um, you know, that we've got very broad kinds of thinking happening with the words in a similar passage, okay, in the same passage. We're getting kids to um, interact with these words, getting them to really have the sense of what the words mean and their morphological family members. We've got additional activities, but do you see that there's always a sentence, okay, where um, in, in here the word cause is being used differently than in this passage, right? So we're, we're moving students across various functions of the words and the meanings, but always in the context of the text. So we're not just pulling the words out separately and saying, now you're going to learn all the inflected endings for this word. But what we're saying is, within texts, these words can take on different meanings. So here you're actually seeing cause as a noun, the previous text, cause as a verb. Here's another example um, where the level's a little bit higher, but where there are numerous opportunities. That's the thing about the general academic words, that they need to be repeated frequently in the context of text with different uses. Why? Because they're abstract words, but they're also which is why they're in the 2,500 words, really powerful words, very versatile words, and they're used frequently across content areas. So in uh, summary, um, what I've talked about today is the core vocabulary. And what I've said is the core vocabulary is group of words, 2,500 complex word families, not just individual words, that account for a huge portion of texts, whether those texts are informational or narrative, across the grade levels. And what we want to do is be aware that these words are highly frequent for a variety of reasons. Some of the words co are concrete words that represent very common things that people use or do. Some of the words, though, are general academic words like estimate and apply that can take on different meanings across subject areas and then are fairly abstract in meaning. How do kids get proficient with these words? They, showing them um, pictures of the concrete words is really helpful. Showing them lots of sentences from text, as we were seeing here, where kids can see the different uses of the words and different uses of the morphological family members is important. But most importantly, we want kids to do a lot of reading. And for kids who are likely to be struggling readers who are at risk, kids who are struggling readers, we really need to give them texts that are sensitive to these notions. And what I've been suggesting is there no longer Dick and Jane kinds of texts. They're not dumbed down in terms of ideas. They're not dumbed down in terms of vocabulary. They're providing kids with challenging and relevant content and opportunities to develop facility with the meanings 
the multiple meanings typically of these core vocabulary words. So let me just share with you um, the things that I've been talking about. I talked some about word pictures. This is the home page of um, Text Project. I talked about FYI for Kids. That's a set of about 100 magazine articles um, that are built on the model that you need to scaffold the experiences with the 2,500 words, just like the Reading Plus program is. I talked about talking points for kids. There's a set of texts that are based on this model that can be downloaded and distributed for summer reading. Uh, beginning reads are um, a downloadable product, but they're also on iTunes. We've got um, lots of materials for teachers to understand some of these ideas better. More professional um, support here in terms of books and articles. And if you have some questions that we don't get answered, um, you can send them to us at textproject.org. So thank you. I um, hope that, oh, and by the way, there are little video snippets actually at YouTube. There's a 77 second on what the core vocabulary is. So if you want to review these ideas in 77 seconds, um, that might be a place to go and do that. So thank you very much for your attention.